British flag, which has flown over Jamaica for the past three centuries, is about to be replaced by the Jamaica national flag, heralding the birth of the new nation. The knights go out. The Union Jack is lowered, and the new flag of Jamaica raised. At a few minutes to midnight on the 30th of August 1962, Her Royal Highness, as the representative of the Queen, witnessed the birth of our nation, the 15th member of the Commonwealth. Representatives from over 50 nations were present when the Union Jack was lowered, marking the end of alien rule. On the stroke of midnight, our own national flag, red, white and black, rose gracefully to the top, marking the attainment of freedom. Two pioneers in independence from colonialism, Trinidad and Jamaica, now celebrating 50 years. We'll talk with their ambassadors up next. Darris Dean. In 1962, two countries stepped out and chose to become independent from colonialism, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. Today they're celebrating 50 years of that independence. We're going to talk with their ambassadors and find out what the successes and failures have been and where are they going next. With me in the studio are His Excellency Stephen Vassiani of Jamaica, welcome to Carib Nation, Thank you. and His Excellency Neil Parson of Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. As I said, the Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago have been pioneers uh, stepping out to take on the challenge of developing your own course from colonialism. And I'm sure that both of you were youngsters at the time. <laughs> but I'd like to uh, get a view from you as to where you think your country has been. What has been the major impact of this independence? And I'll start with you, Ambassador Bassiani. I think this, the strongest thing is the profound sense of nationalism that Jamaicans feel. And that has come out of the independence process. There is a strong national pride mm -hmm. so that on the international stage, everyone aspires to do well. And this reflects itself not only in sports and in entertainment, but in intellectual pursuits and in international relations and so on. We aspire to punch above our weight. And I think that's one of the enduring points of our independence. Ambassador Parsan, how do you see Trinidad and Tobago, which is uh, probably a little more uh, culturally diverse country? Sure. Uh, how would you say independence has impacted Trinidad and Tobago? Well, let me concur with my colleague. I think um, a sense of patriotism, a sense of national pride was surely one of the factors that, that, has, that would have been impactful on our own existence for the last 50 years. But if I may add, I think um, it has really forced us as a people. I mean, diversity is surely one of them, and we'll discuss that momentarily. But I think it has also forced us to come to the realization that an umbilical cord is no longer attached mm -hmm. to a colony, as it were, and a host. And it has forced us to almost survive by almost Darwinian's survival of the fittest. <laughs> so it has, it, it has really allowed us the opportunity to use whatever resources we have had and optimally leverage them to our advantage over time. It has forced us to sort of strengthen our institutions <coughs> to remain 
and have that quasi level of independence that we need as a member state within the region. And you know, in terms of infrastructural development, it has forced us to to really look at ways and means of educating our people to have that level of sustenance and sustainability mm -hmm. as an independent country. And we haven't gotten it 100% where we want it to be, but it's all a maturation process. 50 years is still very young. much a young age. Mm -hmm. That's the equivalent, in my view, of a two or three year old who is aspiring towards adulthood. Mm -hmm. And you will have your stumbles. You, will, you, will, you have to creep before you walk. And I think we have done um, remarkably well, not just noticeably well, but remarkably well in that short space. There are some people who will still um, argue with you that because of the fact that many of our leaders who came, who brought us to independence were educated under the colonial masters, that some of that residue remains, some of that colonial mentality remains, and that some of the leaders have brought it with them into the way they govern our countries. And I wonder how you see that, um, well, Ambassador. Well, um, let's start with Jamaica. Norman Manley was the leader of our independence movement, educated at Oxford. Mm -hmm. His counterpart, <coughs> Sir Alexander Bustamante, not educated in Britain, no particularly profound link to Britain at mm. the intellectual level. Um, and yet still what we saw, I believe, was a greater press for independence through federation from Norman Manley. Mm -hmm. So the fact of having been Oxbridge educated did not necessarily mean that he would cling to the British yes, court yeah. tales. Um, but there are some people in the society who, of course, would continue to aspire to British things and, and to the perception that British things are superior mm -hmm. to, to Caribbean things. And so I believe that the 50-year period has been one of maturation, education, and now a greater acceptance mm -hmm. by the society mm -hmm. that uh, domestic things are of equal quality to things in the, in the metropole. Um, and I see it perhaps most clearly in aspects of the debate concerning the Caribbean Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. Because we are independent in terms of our executive, mm -hmm. we are independent in terms of our legislature, but in terms of yes. our judiciary, Still we are not really played. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the debate about that has reflected mm -hmm. some of the notions that, you know, maybe it's all right to keep the Privy Council because it's a better court than what we have in the mm -hmm. Caribbean, when in fact the quality of the Caribbean Court of Justice is beyond question. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I still see some remnants Residue. of the debate yes. of um, 50 years ago right. in, in our polity. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Ambassador Parsons? Our then Prime Minister, Dr. Eric Williams, was very much cognizant of pre-independence, almost the divide and rule um, scenario that played out with the colonial masters with respect mm -hmm. to our inherently Indian and African population. And, and it is no secret, it is very much documented in history, how that was used as a strategy almost to, to, to keep an attempt at stability within the, within the island. And I think Dr. Eric Williams' history would show that certainly tried his best, given the circumstances, so did Chidi Jagan, so did Ghana in India, in Guyana, to, yeah. to, to, to create that equilibrium that was required to have the equivalent of an all-inclusiveness, as it were, in governance. Mm -hmm. um, one, one could argue that it, 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 it was successful to a point. Mm -hmm. One could argue it, it probably failed to a point. And you know, that, this, that, that notion is probably reflected in the, in the system of almost bipartisan politics we still seem we still to have, have today. Yeah. Although the, in the political parties would have evolved a sense of almost partisan hybridization to govern. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a process that has to be ongoing. And I would, I would very much agree with my colleague with respect to the CCJ, but at this point in our own development, Trinidad and Tobago feels that, um, um, as enunciated by, by my Honorable Prime Minister, Kamala Prasad Bissessa, that we are not there yet mm -hmm. in terms of whole and whole acceptance of same. We surely wanted to look at civil cases on one side and criminal matters on the other via the Privy Council. And um, that is still in dialogue. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's hope that um, over time these things can be discussed and, and, 
ironed out to suit the needs of, of, of sovereign states, but also treat with the region as a whole. That's something to put on the agenda for the next 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> I want to jump back a bit to, to Dr. Williams, if I sure. may, mm -hmm. because I grew up in school hearing about the University of Woodford Square, right. which is where Dr. Williams would give his mm -hmm. lectures. Right. Um, I grew up in school hearing about Massa Day Dunn mm -hmm. and the need yes. for us to be our own oh, governors. Yes. Mm -hmm. I grew up in school with Williams is from Columbus to Castro, mm -hmm. with his capitalism and slavery, with his inward hunger. Right. These are books that inform the generation yes. of yes. independent-minded Caribbean people. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think perhaps there should be a full recognition of the role that Williams played True. in educating mm -hmm us to into independence mm -hmm. and in keeping us alive within independence. I know that there are controversial points about his governance, yes, yeah, sure. but in terms of the Education, psychological yeah. aspect of independence, I think Most he is definitely. one of our leaders. Most mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, when we look also at the rest of the Caribbean and the leadership, of course, that these two countries have, ta has, have taken, uh, do you think that we have succeeded in bringing along the rest of the Caribbean with us, which we would like to talk about CARICOM later, and the role of CARICOM, but in the interaction with the other islands, do you think we've been able to bring along that mentality, that sense of independence from the others? Let me take Trinidad Tobago as, as an example. Our, our case is probably a bit more challenging compared to the rest of the Caribbean mm -hmm. for several reasons. Um, let's take it geographically, if not physically. We, were t we are two islands, mm -hmm. and that in and itself was a challenge yeah. over time. In fact, Tobago, Tobago joined with Trinidad in 1889. Prior to that, Tobago was part of the, the Windward Island Federation, as it were. Yeah. So to bring in those two physical entities together in and itself would have proven a challenge. Mm -hmm. However, at the time, historically, the records would show, we were the model of a, a, almost a pure crown colony for others to look at. In country, there was a level of diversity religiously, yeah. culturally, ethnically, politically, and other. Yeah. So having that model to, to, to balance, you know, as of today, Trinidad and Tobago is about 30 to 40 percent Indo Trinidadian, you know, 40, 41 percent Afro Trinidadian and an other. Mm -hmm. that, that, that diversity in and itself has been a challenge for us to maneuver, but a challenge in a good sense. Yes, because it is Because toughness. that cultural diversity has actually become a tool mm -hmm. for unity in, in, in our own heterogeneous society. Mm -hmm. And using that, I feel, has been exemplary for others. Guyana being one of them yes. over time. Mm -hmm. And where, where, that, where a similar diversity exists. But in terms of spatial and, and, and temporal orientation, there was a, yes, there, so. there was a, there was a phase, a lag phase between, between both. But surely, if I may answer the question, I think that is potentially a model. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think it, it was a model. Mm -hmm. uh, Trinidad and Jamaica provided models because we have to recall that the, the colonial power, Britain, mm -hmm. had this concept of, of readiness for independence. Mm -hmm. And Jamaica and Trinidad mm -hmm. demonstrated by their stability, mm -hmm. by their attempts to grapple with serious problems, this readiness for independence. independence. Now, looking back, it's an offensive concept that they would be yes, judging us as assume. to whether or not we yes, are ready. Exactly. But that's what the history shows. Mm -hmm. Now, Barbados in 66, Guyana in 66, would also have demonstrated this readiness. Mm -hmm. And together with Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, then created a groundswell yes. towards independence mm -hmm. for all the other countries so that by the, the 1970s, independence was a fait accompli yeah. um, for most of the countries. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe we provided a model mm -hmm. for other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's another thing. At the level of constitutional discourse, the forms of the constitutions in Trinidad and mm -hmm. Tobago and Jamaica were adopted in the other countries, yeah, right. which is a way of saying, it was working there, mm -hmm. or it appears to have been working yeah. there. I mean, later on, there were challenges and issues and changes to constitutional forms. But in the early days, the model 
mm -hmm. the Westminster export yes, model yes. was accepted. That brings me to another question. There are some who believe that that model no longer works yes. for the Caribbean. Um, and in your field, uh, as an as a esteemed lawyer, I'm sure you've had many discussions and, and debates about yes, this. Yes. What is your take on whether the Westminster model still works for the Caribbean? Well, there are different elements to the Westminster model. Mm. And again, one is well, the Privy yes. Council issue. But, yeah. but the, the Westminster model, in essence, divides the legislature and the executive mm -hmm. on one side and puts the judiciary on the other side. So there is no real separation of powers between those who make the laws and those who those apply who the law. Yeah. Um, it seems to work for the Caribbean for the most part. Mm -hmm. And I say that because we have had stability um, and we have had governments being changed regularly. Mm -hmm. um, the downside is in the view of some people, it over-concentrates power in the hands of the executive. Yeah. And it said that that tends to promote a remote executive from the people. Mm -hmm. um, that's open to debate. I, I, I think that it has worked um, well mm -hmm. for, the, for the Caribbean. Um, there are some other elements. For instance, we don't have the direct election of a prime minister or a president, mm -hmm. right? You have to vote through constituencies. Right. And some people say, oh, that, that's not really the best way. Why don't you follow the presidential system in the US and so on? We'll debate it for a long time, <laughs> but I don't think that it will be decided um, very soon. Yeah. Yeah. Ambassador Parson, um, Trinidad and Tobago chose to go straight to Republic. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Do you think that is a better, that is a way that the rest of the Caribbean should probably look to? Well, we chose to go that way and I mean, it, it sent a message in, in, in a couple of ways. Having this, almost a governor general, being this symbolic entity yes. on island, but having independence, in my respect, we may or may not send a message in terms of true, true independence. independence. There are some people who question that. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and we chose to go that way. And in Trinidad and Tobago, the president does have a role. Some may argue it's, it's more symbolic than it is substantive vis-a-vis -vis an elected Actually, prime minister. Yeah. But surely it, it's also healthy for a population to, to know psychologically and otherwise there's symbolism behind the elected officials. Mm -hmm. And there's somebody we can fall back on if situations as it has occurred in the past would arise, but there is, there is a, a symbol mm -hmm. to opine. Interesting. The Prime Minister of Jamaica, the most honorable Portia Simpson Miller, mm -hmm. in her inaugural address, mm -hmm. said that it is time for Jamaica to abandon the Queen as the head of state mm -hmm. and to adopt our own indigenous president or right. head of state. I fully support that yeah. position, and, and I think it is time. Yeah, I think that feeds into the perception we talked about earlier that anything coming from outside is better, anything yes. coming from mm -hmm. the British yes. structure yes. is better, and that we undermine our own confidence in, yes. in taking on yeah. the challenges that we face as we go along. Yes. That brings me then to one of the things that have been plaguing the Caribbean, and that is crime, in some cases, corruption. Uh, we've had a coup in Trinidad. We've had uh, more than enough crime labels in, in Jamaica. Yes. How do you address those, and, and do you see those as part of the growing pains in developing towards this first world, if we can use that as a goal? Mm -hmm. Or is this something that is inherent in the culture that we, we haven't got the capability to, to cope with? Crime, criminality, violence, gang violence is something that's very, that's, 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 that I hold dear to me. I've been discussing this at, at almost ad <coughs> libitum, ad verbatim since I've been here. And let me say this categor categorically. Over 95% of the crimes committed in Trinidad and Tobago, it's related to drug trade. Mm -hmm. it's, That's my next I, 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 I have gone beyond calling it narco-trafficking. I think it's narco-terrorism. Mm -hmm. Terrorism. 
And it's quite unfortunate for us in the Caribbean simply because for several reasons. I think we all are acutely aware of who the producers of these narcotics are. We know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. We are also aware that over the last decade or so, new routes and paths have been developed for the tra trafficking of these narcotics. I think we are also very aware of who the consumers are. If I may call a country, Mexico and the United States, they have been having some very successful initiatives on their bilaterally to really stamp out the movement of drugs through their borders. And we have seen a very clear pattern developing where it is now rerouting itself over the last decade through the Caribbean to either go transatlantic or north. Mm -hmm. And I wish not call any country's name. But mm -hmm. when look, one looks at the geog geographic spread of the Caribbean islands, one would appreciate the porosity of our borders. Mm -hmm. And in, ver in many instances, our inability, due to two things, a lack of resources and lack of expertise to appropriately patrol mm -hmm. and guard against mm -hmm. our own sovereign waters. That in and itself has fed. And when you have islands becoming intermediaries for narco-terrorism, it will naturally feed an undesired industry. It's almost, a, it's almost a, the, the narcotic sector mm -hmm. sure. automatically blossoms overnight. Yeah. That has happened to Trinidad and Tobago. And we have been really partnering based on several pieces of legislation by the US through the CB, CBSI mm -hmm. and others to really try to grapple with this issue. And it's an issue that um, the rest of the, the, of the Caribbean continues to face. And it's mm -hmm. quite unfortunate. We are not producers of narcotics. Mm -hmm. And we are sad. minimalist consumers. We are caught in the wrong place yeah. at the wrong time. I wish not blame anybody for this or our problem. But let's face it, we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I feel a very, very well orchestrated effort has to be made. The Caribbean cannot handle this issue as the Caribbean. Yeah. It has to be from production to consumption and all the other intermediaries and variable inputs in between to mitigate this challenge. And, and that brings yeah. me to the question whether the the, the United States, which is supposedly our big brother uh, in this fight, whether we're getting enough from them? Well, there is the CBSI, which has been mentioned, mm -hmm. Caribbean Basin Security Initiative. But there is also the Ship Rider Program, mm -hmm. yes. in oh, which yes. the US assists in searching vessels right. in the Caribbean Sea um, for, for drugs. Um, the United States has also been keen, in some instances, to have extradition arrangements mm -hmm. with respect to known drug traffickers so that they are helping. Is it enough? I, th I think there is scope for, for greater assistance mm -hmm. in this problem because it's a shared problem. Right. Um, it's also the case that we have a high level of crime partly because of levels of inequality in the society. Mm -hmm. That people sometimes don't feel that society has invested in them. And therefore, why should they invest in the rule mm -hmm. of law exactly. in the society? If I may also add to that, sorry, um, Dean, is there's an issue of deportees. Mm -hmm. And we have been looking at that issue throughout the region and discussing it here in Washington. And Let's face it, one has to respect sovereign law coming emanating from the United States and, or any other country that creates their own laws. But I think a, a very detailed examination needs to be had with respect to the movement of deportees over the last few mm. years to our respective islands. In, in some instances, sure. these numbers are quite high. And the, you know, when, deportee, when, when nationals of the Caribbean are deported to their respective sovereign states, they bring with them a certain skill set that's either okay. used very negatively and in a few instances positively. Mm -hmm. We have had some very pleasant occurrences with positive use of these skill sets when they come, but I'm sure in many the instances part, it's, yeah. it's employing these skill sets that would have been had over the many years in a negative sense. So when, when society is not necessarily, let's say the, the receipt of these, as we receive these reportees, you know, we have been looking at the, the, the records that come in, mm -hmm. the, 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 the level of, of rehabilitation if need be, because we need, all of our sovereign states would need these records and so on to understand, if, um, what's happening. take each case on its own merit, how do we integrate them into society, how do we classify them, how do we rehabilitate them. And when poor records are had and you receive a deportee, it, it becomes a challenge, especially in, in, in the light of lack of resources and proper expertise of to handle them and receive them. 
one needs to look at that as an issue too that feeds as one of the variables into the whole into system the of whole crime. crime. Okay. But you know, there's a paradox here. Mm -hmm. People may be deported to the Caribbean because they are Caribbean nationals. Mm. But if they become US citizens, that avenue that goes away. Goes away yeah. But why haven't they become US citizens? Because At the start, I mentioned the strong yeah. sense of nationalism, nationalism that they have. Exactly. Therein lies the paradox. Yeah. So we need to work through, in a collaborative way with the United sure. States, mm -hmm. ways of dealing with this problem. I, I don't think it's enough for us to, to just say, stop sending the people. Right. I think we need to work mm -hmm. it out as to with how to solve this problem. Right. Because we it suits the United States not to have a crime-infested Caribbean. Of course. So we need to work yeah. though. Yeah. Good point. We're fast running out of time, and sure. I, there's one thing, I, two things I'd like to get to, and that especially, where do you see these two islands in the next 50 years? What do you think should be on the agenda? And if we can squeeze it in time, the role of CARICOM in getting there. And uh, let me come back to you. The agenda, economic development, mm -hmm. more trade, greater levels of foreign investment, a greater attention to the service sector in these countries, recognition that we can benefit from globalization because mm -hmm. of our location, because of our, of our facility with the English language, which is right. the universal language, and because of our proximity, not only to North America, but to South mm -hmm. America. So we need, I think, to press hard on the economic front for development. Mm -hmm. People have been doing that but we need to continue that. <coughs> we also need, I think, to take advantage of opening up our societies. Many of the class structures mm -hmm. that we inherited from colonialism have been have broken been. down, but yeah. some still remain. We have to work towards reducing these class mm -hmm. divisions in the society. Mm -hmm. And we need to work towards evening up income inequalities, inequalities so that in everyone society. feels that yeah. society invests in them. Right. Yeah. Ambassador Parson, anything you'd like to add to that? I think partnerships will be fostered over the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. Historically, our partners would have been intra-Caribbean and North South. Yeah. And I think a lot of uh, um, initiatives will be taking place with Africa, for example, with Latin America. I see a lot of um, partnerships and relationships and movement of good, service, good services and people mm -hmm. will be taking place with Central America or brothers and sisters in South America. And I am actually seeing as a result of that, and I hope it happens, we break down the language barrier, finally. Yes, yes. Finally. Let's, let's hybridize English with Spanish and other, yeah. because it has been rate limiting, if not prohibitory to the success of the Caribbean, True. because of our unilateral tongue, yeah. English. Isolation. And I feel we are ideally geographically and also geopolitically positioned. That's an important point in terms of the Caribbean has had a proud history of democracy in its mm -hmm. existence, True. and we have been a mitigator and a balancer of geopolitical forces globally, not just in the Western Hemisphere. And it's time we leverage that position we have. Yeah. And I feel Africa, Latin America, and why not the East? And I, I think that is where we will be going in the next 50 years. That's forward looking. Yes. Well, we did run out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> we don't have enough time to talk about CARICOM. But I do want to thank you both, and uh, congratulations on Independence, August 6th and August 31st. 31st. Mm -hmm. And um, all the best for the next 50 years. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining us in Carib Nation. And that's it for now. Until next time, I'm Darius Dean. Remember, our motto is one people, one culture, one Caribbean, one nation.